Well, good morning. We're going to continue our study of the book of Ecclesiastes this morning. We'll be studying God's Word together. And if you don't have a copy of a Bible, we'd love to put one in your hands. And there's some men here that will come down the aisles. Just slip your hand up. Let them know that you need a, a Bible this morning so that you can follow along with us. I would invite you all to turn this morning to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. We're in the middle section of Ecclesiastes. Solomon has been dragging us through this horizontal perspective of life under the sun. He's caused us to despair of the futility of trying to find meaning in a broken, fallen world. And to this point, he has pondered, asked, surmised. And now in this middle section of Ecclesiastes, we stumble into a Proverbs-style assimilation of nuggets of wisdom. But here the passage we come to this morning is a little bit abrupt, where Solomon has had us in the horizontal, driving us to look above the sun and to think vertically, to have a God-oriented perspective. Now, all of a sudden, God is in plain view in chapter 5. In fact, God is mentioned seven times in the first seven verses of Ecclesiastes 5. Solomon here is going to introduce us to a theocentricity, a, a God-centered approach to worship. He's going to tell us how to go to temple. He's going to tell us how to worship God. Now, we've got to sort of get in the time-traveling device here, go back 3,000 years, place ourselves in Israel in Solomon's day, and locate ourselves at the temple of God where he was to be worshiped. In our day, and in, in the church, in the 21st century, there, there are a lot of approaches to worship, and if you were to survey the landscape of Christianity, you might think there are no instructions whatsoever for how to do this. And a lot of churches do a lot of different things, and uh, some of the popular things, some of the things that are done in churches on Sunday mornings range from funny video clips to smoke machines and laser lights, crude humor, foul music professional performances, celebrities, athletes, hot topics, current events, bedroom talk. A lot of those things stem from a pragmatic philosophy of we've just got to get people in the door. And so we have clever, entertaining, practical speeches. You know, the, the kind of talks that will make you cry a little bit, make you laugh a little bit. And not too long, not too serious, but you know, some good life coaching. A pep talk, some pop psychology. We all need a little help to fulfill our dreams, and that's what church is for. God is there to pick me up when I'm down. He, he's there to fill my love tank. He's there to help me get my best life now. And so church, the programmed collective worship of God is tweaked for the consumer's preference. Now, what happens in many buildings on a Sunday morning is often called a worship service. And one needs to ask who or what is being worshipped and who is being served. If I asked today's churchgoer, who is the worship team? They would probably point to the stage and to the group of mus musicians assembled behind the smoke. And if you ask them, who is the audience? They would probably point to the seated masses. Who is being served in this service? And if they dared to answer, they might, just a little bit chagrined, admit, well, me. I'm here to be served. And if they don't admit it directly, well, they will say it with their feet, going from church to church until they find one that suits their preferences. We have applied the Burger King mantra to the worship of God, right? Have it your way. I mean, if I have to go to church, it, it had better be worth my time. I at least could be entertained. If, if I have to check off the box and, and do the church thing and, and give my duty to God, if I'm going to give God this precious hour of my busy life, there had better be some return for me. If I'm going to put a little of my hard-earned money in the plate or, or the card reader or direct deposit or whatever it is, then there had better be something in it for me, some, I don't know, practical tip to help me live my life a little more efficiently. Maybe some emotional charge to make me feel good about myself. And we've reduced God to something like a fairy godmother or a genie in a bottle. I check the box. I go through the motions. Now, God, you give me in return what it is that I want. 
I don't think there's anything new under the sun. For what Solomon will instruct temple worshipers in his day 3,000 years ago (laughs) will have some very straight lines to our present day today. Solomon in his day observed the ease with which people seem to slip into a careless approach to God. You see, when the abject terror of the presence of the holiness of God is worn off, worshipers begin to take for granted his gracious provision of access to himself. We might say that God's goodness gets eclipsed, or God's goodness has completely eclipsed his greatness. The free access has been turned to free license. And public corporate worship, by the way, that's an old English word that comes from the idea of worthship, the public declaration of the worth of someone, that corporate worship of God degenerates to something else. And and maybe it's something casual or flippant or thoughtless, or heartless, or customary, or superstitious, or cultural, or insincere, perhaps pretentious, or manipulative, superficial, or compartmentalized, hypocritical, formal, consumerish, or perhaps self-centered, self-serving, irreverent, or recreational. What Solomon seeks to do in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 is to recover theocentric worship at the temple. And the corollary to that is the demolition of meocentric worship at the temple. Will you read with me Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verses 1 to 7? Here is God's word. Guard your steps as you go to the house of God and draw near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they are doing evil. Do not be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God, for God is in heaven and you are on the earth. Therefore, let your words be few. For the dream comes through much effort and the voice of a fool through many words. When you make a vow to God, do not be late in paying it. For he takes no delight in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Do not let your speech cause you to sin. And do not say in the presence of the messenger of God that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry on account of your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For in many dreams and in many words, there is emptiness. Rather, fear God. Oh God, we come to your word this morning. I pray in recognition of our desperate need. We come with our own thoughts, our own perceptions, our own distractions. We come with a a week behind us where the world around us has sought to press us into its mold. And we need to be unpressed. We need to be impressed with you, with your greatness, your glory, your grandeur. Oh God, we need an encounter with the holy, almighty, omnipotent, omnipresent God who knows all things and sees the hearts. We need you by the power of your Holy Spirit to give a listening ear to your word. May we hear so as to obey. Oh God, use these few fleeting precious moments to transform us as we sit under your word. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Solomon here in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 gives instructions for public worship. In fact, he'll give us four prescriptions for appropriately approaching Yahweh at his temple. These are warnings against a casual approach to God, a careless approach, mindless chatter, empty promises, and a casual attitude. All will be addressed in this. Again, we need to think back here a little bit and and rewind 3,000 years. 
to walk in the sandals of worshipers in Israel who would go to Jerusalem to go to the temple where God's special presence was manifested, to imagine what it was like to worship there. Let's sit in the shoes of an Israelite worshiper under Solomon's reign 3,000 years ago. Solomon's first instruction for public worship in the temple is this, prepare yourself. Prepare yourself. And he says it this way in verse 1. Guard your steps as you go to the house of God and draw near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they are doing evil. And Solomon begins here with an imperative, a command. This is the first time he's gotten preachy. (laughs) He's been philosophizing and, and now he's giving direct commands. You see, he's been driving us towards a vertical perspective to have God thoughts while we walk under the sun. And here, like a lightning bolt through the haze, Solomon gives us very clear directions for how to address God at the temple. This idea that we would prepare ourselves for worship, the the idea of a warning against a careless approach begins in verse 1 with these words, guard your steps as you go. Guard your steps as you go. Notice that Solomon is addressing the worshiper before he arrives at the temple. There is to be a preparation before you get there, a preparation for public worship. And the guard your steps is sort of reminiscent of what God told Moses in Exodus 3.5. Moses, take off your shoes, for the ground you are on is holy ground. What made the ground holy? God's manifest presence. And Solomon here talks about the house of God. Guard your steps as you go to the house of God. What does he mean by that? Solomon has in mind public worship at the temple. At the temple. This phrase, house of God, was first applied to the place called Bethel, which means house of God. In Genesis 28, 17, Jacob, after his dream about the ladder and the angels, he said this, Surely Yahweh is in this place. How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And he named the place house of God or Bethel. The phrase house of God was also applied to the tabernacle. You know, that was that portable tent with the Ark of the Covenant and the concentric squares of worship access. In Judges 18.31, it is called the house of God. And then Solomon calls the temple, the temple that David assembled all the materials for and Solomon himself superintended the construction of. In 1 Kings 8.27, he called that temple the house of God. Now, was Solomon confused, thinking that God was merely singularly present somewhere rather than omnipresent, present everywhere? No, in fact, when Solomon dedicated the very temple that he built that he called the house of God, he said, heavens and the highest heavens can't contain you. How much less this little box that I've built. And so Solomon was not confused in thinking that God was somehow confined to this man-made structure. No, God is everywhere. In fact, God transcends what everywhere is. And God manifests himself in location in this building, this temple, where he has provided for himself access for the people who would come and worship him. And the temple worship was characterized by animal sacrifice, A reminder that sinners could not come into the presence of a holy God without a sacrifice for sin. An innocent substitute has to be slain in place of the worshiping sinner. The word of God was read in the temple. Prayers were said in the temple. Singing was done in the temple. Later on in the tabernacle, the the preaching of the word of God took a prominent place. The temple was where private worshipers gathered together to honor God corporately and publicly. You remember David wrote songs of praise to God. Many of them are recorded in our Bible. And he wrote them in fields and in caves. When he was out in nature, when he was on the run from his enemies, he worshiped God privately. Throughout the Bible, you'll find saints who pray constantly and worship God in various ways. But what Solomon has in view here is corporate, public, gathered worship. This is the place where God has promised to manifest his presence in a unique way. And in verse 1, Solomon gives this command, draw near to listen. Draw near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools. Listening's hard. Listening's difficult. Sometimes we like the sound of our own voice. We might be infatuated with the course of our own thoughts. 
but coming to hear from God, to think his thoughts after him, is a great recognition of the creature, creator, sorry, creature, creator distinction. That we are dependent, that God is the one who gives and gives and gives and gives, and we are but needy creatures. The word listen here in Hebrew is often translated obey. That might sound kind of weird to us. Uh, To listen and to obey, that seems like two different activities. Well, not in the Old Testament. This idea of listening had embedded in it the idea of listening so as to do. Listen to the way the same word is used in 1 Samuel 15, 22. To obey is better than sacrifice. Same word as listen here. In fact, if you were to sit down this afternoon and read Moses' sermon, his last sermon, the book of Deuteronomy, and just notice how many times Moses uses phrases like, listen to obey, hear to obey, listen to do, hear to do. The idea of listening and obedience were joined together. Here the idea is not just have some auditory recollection of what happens at the temple. (laughs) No, but let it stick. In the heart, let it affect and transform your life so that you live out in worship privately what you have heard and taken in in the context of public corporate worship. And this puts the worship service in the temple in the proper perspective. Worshippers needed what God had for them far more than God needed what the worshipers had for him. The sacrifice here, the, the, there are a number of types of sacrifices done in the temple. The word for sacrifice here is an animal killed in sacrifice that is then eaten in celebration by the worshipers. This is different than the whole burnt offering that is consumed completely in the fire. This word for sacrifice is the sacrifice that was killed and then cooked and then eaten in celebration and worship. And It could probably be easy for you to understand how that kind of worship, that aspect of temple worship, could degenerate into partying. Just the sheer enjoyment of fun and food and friends. Very quickly, that kind of worship could degenerate in the the hearts of unprepared worshipers into pure revelry. It, It happened all the time in the Old Testament. Solomon calls this the sacrifice of fools. The fool in wisdom literature has nothing to do with his IQ, has everything to do with his way of life. A fool is someone who has rejected God's ways, pursued his own ways in rebellion against his creator. And the sacrifice of fools is that public worship which is brought in emptiness. We might call it religion. It is casual or flippant or thoughtless. It is without heart. It is perhaps hypocritical. Sometimes it can be very formal, very sincere, very intentional. But the sacrifice of fools has not been brought to God on God's terms from the heart. The so-called worshiper is not treating God as holy. The sacrifice of fools is a busyness about religious activity. It is a sacrifice. They are at the temple and yet they are in rebellion against the one they claim to be sacrificing too. The air may be filled with pious-sounding phrases, with no heart to listen and obey. You may be thinking of Aaron's sons in Leviticus 10. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans, and after putting fire in them, placed incense on it and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, It is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I will be treated as holy, and before all the people, I will be honored. Therefore, Aaron, the dad who lost two sons in flippant, casual, foolish worship, that dad remained silent. You might think of Eli's sons in 1 Samuel 2. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men and they did not know Yahweh. Now what did they do in their public worship? They took the best parts of the meat for themselves. They disregarded God's specific instructions. They stole from the people. And God addresses Samuel 
or God addresses Eli, the dad, why do you kick at my sacrifice and at my offering, which I have commanded in my dwelling? And you honor your sons above me by making yourselves fat with the choicest of every offering of my people Israel. Therefore, the Lord God of Israel declares, I did indeed say that your house and the house of your father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me will be lightly esteemed. What does Solomon say about such worship? It's evil. Do you see that in verse 1? They do not know they are doing evil. Now consider that. Religious activity. Public religious activity. Sacrifice is given. Time is spent. Money is spent. And God says it is evil evil. And they're so foolish, they don't even realize that their so-called worship is actually evil. The fool has, in fact, replaced God as the center of gravity in public worship. It has become about the person rather than about God. And God despises such so-called worship. See, man's religion is one of the great deceptions in our fallen world. Man's religion attempts to appease the conscience, but it does nothing to make a man right before a holy God. It accomplishes just the opposite of what the religious person hopes. The worshiper is hoping that he can check off the religious boxes and earn his way to blessing, or earn his way to some favor, or earn his way to eternal life. And he's hoping that just showing up somehow erases God's memory of his crimes, And instead of mitigating God's anger, this empty, foolish religion only compounds God's anger. It only adds to the man's crimes. God has provided access to himself through sacrifice. A sacrifice has paved the way for access to God. Sacrifice has not paved the way for license to do whatever we want when we approach God. There's a second instruction Solomon gives to correct temple worship in his day. He says, watch your words in verses 2 and 3. By the way, the the words about words fill this passage. So much of the worship that Solomon is addressing has to do with speech And the content of our speech, here he zeroes in on it. Do not be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. For the dream comes through much effort and the voice of a fool through many words. This is a warning against mindless chatter. The prohibition, don't be hasty in words, don't be impulsive in thought. That is, come to listen and obey. Those who are hasty in words and are impulsive in thought, they're not there to acquire God's perspective. They're there to air their own thoughts. A right perspective on public worship at the temple was to have restraint, both in thought and in word. And he says, don't be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God. Okay, so where is God? What do we mean by his presence here? We we recognize that God is omnipresent. He is in heaven. Jesus said, our Father who is in heaven. Heaven is his throne room. The earth is his footstool. He is everywhere all the time. But here at the temple, Solomon refers to God's special manifest presence. And the perspective he gives to correct this hastiness in word is the infinite distance between us and God. He says, God is in heaven and you are on the earth. Right? That should be obvious to us. It doesn't need to be said, and yet it needs to be said. We need to be reminded that we are not equals with God. We are not peers with God. We are not buddies with God. I remember serving in jury duty a number of years ago and just sitting waiting to either be deselected or selected or for somehow this long process to be over. And as I watched people file into the courtroom and stand before some judge and make a defense for themselves or be told to take a hike or whatever, 
I was surprised at the various responses that people give. Some people walked in and their hands folded, their shoulders slouched forward, and they said, yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Dismissed. You know, other people protested and made a big show and were boisterous and loud. And I can just tell you as an observer, (laughs) one of those was appropriate for the setting and the other was not. One actually was pleasing to the judge who had your future in his hands. And the other was not so helpful. I don't know if you've ever been in the presence of someone or something so intimidating, so large, maybe so scary, that you just closed your mouth. There's something right about that in worship. That you weren't to go to the temple to have a little chat with a casual acquaintance. In fact, the animal sacrifices were not carried on with background music. (laughs) People didn't chatter uh, idly while an animal's throat was being slit and blood went everywhere. It actually was a silent, somber experience, sobering. You went to the temple to worship in reverential fear of the holy, almighty God of the universe, the creator and sustainer of all things, the one who has your life in his hands. The infinite distance between the worshiper and a holy God has been bridged, and you shouldn't be able to believe that you're standing here in his presence. And that infinite distance has not been bridged by the good behavior or the religious duties of the worshiper, but by the indescribable mercy and kindness of God. As one pastor said, his goodness must not cause us to forget his greatness. So Solomon's instruction here, let your words be few. Let them be measured, well weighed. Oh, wait a second, is Solomon saying, don't pray very much? No. If we fast forward to the New Testament for just a moment, we think about 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Christians are to pray all the time, everywhere. <laughs> Wherever they go, your whole life is to be a, a life of devotion and worship and prayer and communication to God. Your whole life poured out to Him in an unceasing devotion and prayer. But there's a distinction Solomon is making between private worship and public worship at the temple. And in the public worship at the temple... His instructions were, let your words be few. Jesus, speaking about the temple, of course Solomon's temple was destroyed in 587 BC, rebuilt after the exile, and then rebuilt again by Herod. As the temple stood in Jesus' day, he called it his father's house, and he said it was to be a house of prayer. Right? People were to come to the temple and offer public prayers before God. People who prayed privately everywhere were also to gather together at the temple with others to pray publicly. It was condoned behavior. It was a good thing to do. It was worship. You remember the scene of two people praying publicly, a Pharisee and a tax collector that Jesus pointed out in the temple? One of them bloviated, long-winded, self-righteous pronouncements, and another one prayed short, humble, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Verse 3, Solomon gives a pithy little statement, an analogy, a, a proverb, an observation to back up what he's saying about prayer and our words before God in public worship. For the dream comes through much effort and the voice of a fool through many words. What does that mean? He means that when you work hard, and you've exerted a lot of effort during the day, and you lay your head down to sleep, all of that mental activity can chase you into your sleeping hours and fill your head with dreams. I don't know if you've had that experience. I remember running a youth camp one year with two houseboats on a lake. Weeks later, I would wake up in the middle of the night thinking, oh, is there enough gas in the houseboat to keep the generator running? where's Gregory? Did he fall off the boat? Does everybody have their life vest? Where is so-and-so's left sock? I I woke up in the middle of the night just dreaming about this event because 
my mind had been so engaged with all the details of that thing. You work hard, your mind races, you carry it into your sleep, but when you wake up, poof, the dream's gone. It sort of evaporates like the steam on the top of a warm lake on a cool morning. You try to hold on to the details. You even try to tell somebody else about the dream you just had. And as you're saying it, the details evaporate. That's the illustration. And Solomon says, just like a dream when you wake up and poof, it's gone. So also all of these words of the foolish worshiper. They're meaningless. They're valueless. Poof, they're gone. Solomon here is not talking about prophetic revelation. He's just talking about a fool's voice. Lots of words produces only foolishness. And then poof, like a dream, it evaporates. It's meaningless, of no value. We already know that where where words are many, sin is sure to follow. The more you talk, the more opportunity you give for folly and sin. And when you take that principle and take it into the context of public worship, Solomon calls it foolishness. Think about empty religious repetition of words, the the spewing out of religious lingo, fitting in with everybody else with some pious sounding phrases. You can pray prayerless prayers, you know, where your lips are moving but your heart has stopped addressing God. You can sing devotionless songs. Or even if no sounds are coming out of your mouth, your, your head runs with the distractions of your own imaginations rather than coming to listen to God's truth and engage with him from the heart. Solomon gives another warning. He tells us in verses 4 to 6, consider your vows. When you make a vow to God, he says, do not be late in paying it, for he takes no delight in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. This is a warning against empty promises. Solomon here is not making a general statement about the importance of integrity. He's not saying, tell the truth and keep your word. That's very important to God. Uh, That is not what's being specifically addressed here. This is a specific admonition about public worship. This is about the taking of vows in the context of public worship. Uh, This is what you do before God and before others, a solemn promise that the worshiper promises to fulfill in the future. We maybe do something like this with marriage vows. You stand before God, you stand before others, and you say, I promise this, and I promise that, and I promise this. You don't do those things lightly. And there are consequences when you don't fulfill those vows. We do this at Grace Bible Church in church membership. You go through the church membership class, and then we read those promises we make to one another. Those are to be taken seriously, there's a, an end to that. If, if I should ever leave Grace Bible Church, I promise to attach myself to another local body and continue to use, you know, I can't remember all the words of it. We take those things seriously. We make those declarations and statements. The Old Testament actually gives a lot of regulation about vow making and vow keeping. Vow keeping in the Old Testament or vow making in the Old Testament is not required This was a voluntary worship activity. In fact, verses 4 to 5 are almost a virtual quote from Deuteronomy chapter 23. There Moses gives the instructions for vows. He says, when you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it, for it would be sin in you, and the Lord your God will surely require it of you. However, if you refrain from vowing, it would not be sin to you. You shall be careful to perform what goes out from your lips, just as you have voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised. Now, there's some kind of vows that you could make that biblically could be undone. Numbers chapter 30, verses 3 and following gives a long list of the kind of vow that someone could make rashly and is not to be held accountable. But there are very strict guidelines for how that is done, a very limited scope. Now, why would people make vows? In the Old Testament, there are a number of references and stories to vows. The psalm writers speak of giving your vows to Yahweh in the context of temple worship. 
Some people made vows to the Lord to express gratitude. God, I'm so thankful for all you've done for me. I'm just going to bring this extra sacrifice to the temple. And a vow keeping could be a, a, in the context of the free will offering in the temple. Not one of the prescribed offerings, but just I want to voluntarily give something extra to God. It could be a, a monetary thing. It could be a sacrifice of an animal. It, it could have been charity given. It could have been something to help defray the costs in the temple, to provide for the priests. Some people made vows to refrain from something that was enjoyable, even temporarily, as a sacrifice to God. Some vowed to give charitably. Some vowed to promise something in return for divine help. You remember Hannah's vow. She said, oh, God, if you would give me a child, I will devote him to you. And she did that very thing. You may remember Jephthah's vow in Judges chapter 11. Not a good one. Not something to model your promises to God after. Cost him his daughter. Paul made vows. Now, Paul, in the New Testament, is operating in a transition period where the temple still stood. The Mosaic law was still being practiced. And he went into the temple and made vows. The warning from Solomon here is to be careful about making a serious resolution in an emotional moment of worship or desperation or need or joy or whimsy. You see, promises made by us are dangerous, are they not? You and I are not sovereign. More than that, you and I are sinful. And sometimes we obligate ourselves beyond our ability. And yet God holds the worshiper accountable to his obligations. Promises are dangerous as well because we are manipulators, right? We, we want to do bargains with God. We think, if I, if I do this for you, God, then, then this is what I really want. And, and can we do a little trade here? And the real danger for the manipulating worshiper is he's turned God into sort of like a genie in the lamp. You know, you rub the lamp three times and out comes the genie and give you your wishes. Except you're saying to God, God, will you come out and give me my wishes? And I promise I'll rub the lamp three times. And after you get what you want, oh, I guess I don't need to rub the lamp. That's what Solomon is addressing in verse 6. Do not let your speech cause you to sin, and don't say in the presence of the messenger, it was a mistake. Why should God be angry on account of your voice? Here the messenger is the priest or the envoy of the priest who has come to collect on the worshiper's vow. A worshiper made a promise, I'm going to bring three lambs next Tuesday, and I really want to pray and pour out my heart to God. And Tuesday comes and the lambs aren't there. The priest sends his messenger, where are those lambs? You made a vow before God. And the worshiper says, oh, you know, it was, it was a mistake. It's all a big mistake. I think Solomon was addressing a, a real practice and a real phenomenon. I don't think it would take very long to get from 1 Kings chapter 8 and the dedication of the temple to people trying to manipulate God through worship activities. In the Mishnah, which is a Jewish commentary on the application of biblical law to various areas of life, it was written in the 2nd century B.C., most likely through the 2nd century A.D. Uh, the Mishnah was a collection of uh, teachers and scholars in the Jewish faith whose commentary sort of ruled Jewish life even the days when Jesus was on the earth. There's a section in the Mishnah called the Nedarim, all about vows. I'll read to you Nedarim 9.9. .9. If a man said, had I known that it would be so, I wouldn't have made my vow. If a man comes to you and says that, then he's released from the vow. Do you hear that? That's a hole you could drive a truck full of lame excuses through. <laughs> Basically, anything goes. Uh, the man is saying there were unforeseen circumstances. It would be like vowing to abstain from wine for a month and then the next day getting invited to a wedding where it would be socially awkward, embarrassing for you not to raise a glass. Well, if I had known I was getting get invited to this very important wedding, I wouldn't have made the vow. Okay, you're released from the vow, said the Jewish scholars. Not says God. God says, don't be late in paying it. God takes no delight in fools. Pay what you owe. It'd be better that you never vowed than you would vow and not pay. 
Solomon says, don't sin. This is a voluntary promise. Nobody's compelling you to make a vow. Nobody's telling you you have to do this, and you just do this freely, and you're not taking it seriously. To claim that it was a mistake is to actually admit that you came to God in worship flippantly, that you took God lightly, that you trifled with the Holy One. And what will God do about that? He sees through the lame excuses. Solomon says, he will destroy the work of your hands. And I believe that means that he will make the efforts of your religious efforts worth nothing. Nadab and Abihu were killed on the spot. Eli's sons were brought to judgment. And their whole household, their whole line was separated. And you must know that ultimate judgment is coming for every religionist. Everyone who attempted to worship God, but not on God's terms. Everyone who tried to address their God consciousness, but not through God's provision of substitutionary sacrifice. Not on the basis of faith, not according to God's word. You can read about God's judgments against hypocritical worship in Isaiah 1, and Matthew 23. Solomon gives a fourth instruction for worship in the it is simply this, fear God, fear God. This is a warning against a casual attitude. He says, in many dreams and in many words, there is emptiness. Listen, this should be obvious enough to us. In all of the dreams you've ever had, put them all together and what do you have? Basically nothing. Your dreams are a jumble of disintegrated images and thoughts spliced together in haphazard fashion by your brain while you sleep. And the moment you awake, the clarity of what seemed like a storyline dissolves like the mist And Solomon compares that to the many words. Again, we think that what we offer to God is so important. And Solomon said, all of our words, it's a vanity. The bottom line is fear God. That's the bottom line of all of Ecclesiastes. Solomon's entire sermon is driving toward this theme. And he interjects it right here in the middle in Ecclesiastes 5, addressing public worship. Now, we're not living 3,000 years ago. We're not governed by Mosaic law. We do not live in Israel. We do not go to the temple in Jerusalem. We do not offer sacrifices according to Leviticus. We need to think a little bit about what is the same between our situation and Solomon's day. We need to think a little bit about what is different. Let's think about God for a moment. God is omnipotent all-powerful, the creator, sustainer. He is mighty. He is awesome. He is omniscient. He knows everything. He sees the heart of the worshipers. He knows the motives. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. He manifests his presence specially in the temple in Solomon's day, but now we are the temple. That's a fundamental difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, between Israel's worship and the church's worship. The church is comprised of believers who individually, 1 Corinthians 6.19, are called the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. And collectively, 1 Corinthians 3.16, are called the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. Do you understand that? You, You individual Christian are the temple of God, and we collective believers are the temple of God. The temple of God no longer is brick and mortar where God specially manifests his presence. But now God manifests his presence everywhere a believer goes and everywhere believers gather. And then God has commanded believers to gather in local assemblies called the church and he's regulated what church worship is to look like and how it's supposed to be and what we're supposed to do. But God himself has not changed. The way in has not changed. The the way in is by grace. You must know that the way in in the Old Testament worship was by grace. It was by substitution. An innocent animal was sacrificed in place of the sinner. Now all of that was a foreshadow of the great substitution that God would do through his own son, Jesus Christ. When God came in the flesh, when the son of God was here, he came for the express purpose of going to a cross, laying down his own life like a sheep before the slaughter, like a sheep before his shears was silent before his executioners. And like all those sacrificial animals before were slain, killed, 
in the place of the guilty. Jesus Christ, the final sacrifice, was killed in the place of the guilty so as to absorb and finish all of the wrath of God for everyone who would ever believe and make a way of direct access for the worshiper to God. You and I live in a better era than Solomon's day. And yet it's the same. The same God we worship, the same basis of our acceptance, God's grace through provision of sacrifice to take away sin, Has something changed for the church that should cause us now to approach God casually, recreationally, thoughtlessly, heartlessly? Has something changed in the church today that we should come to worship God with mindless chatter and empty drivel? Has something changed in the church today now where we are free to approach God on our own terms, demand our own desires, bargain with God for favors, or make empty promises? Has anything changed whereby we should no longer fear God, revere Him, or be humble before Him? Has something changed where now we should allow God's kindness to eclipse His transcendence? His goodness to overshadow His greatness? There is an acceptable worship, according to Hebrews 12, 28, 29. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Which means there is an unacceptable kind of worship still today. Jesus' payment for our sins does not open the door for, hey, write the worship script however you want. The fear of the Lord is still the beginning of wisdom. And the fear of the Lord is still the foundation of true worship. Ask Ananias and Sapphira. Ask the church at its very beginning. Do you remember Ananias and Sapphira? What did they do? They they were guilty of not fulfilling a vow before the Lord in the context of the local church. They volunteered freely to sell their property and to give all of the proceeds to the needs of the local body of believers. And then they went back on what they had promised. They had second thoughts. Maybe they had read Netarim 9.9. <laughs> they conspired together to keep back some of the proceeds. And, and while it might look like their sacrifice was as cool as Stephen's, who had just sacrificed all his stuff before them, they lied to the church. And they were told, you really haven't lied to the church. You've lied to God. God sees through it. Acts 5.5, 5, as Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came over all who heard of it. And verse 10, his wife died the same way. I just think that's interesting that at two significant transitional points where the tabernacle is being established, phony worship, foolish worship, ends up in the death of the worshipers offering strange fire. And in the beginning of the church, Another significant transition moment in God's redemptive history. Phony worship ends up in the death of the worshipers. Consider Paul's instructions to the Corinthian believers about how they were taking communion. In your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry and another is drunk. Remember in the Old Testament sacrifice, people would go and they would eat the meal together in celebration surrounding the sacrifice. And and at the church at Corinth, the, the communion table had become a selfish feast. Of people filling their bellies and getting drunk on wine and forsaking love and preferring others and revering God. What happened to the Corinthian church? Here's what Paul says. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. Uh, they're not taking a nap. They're dead. Lest we think that there is too much distance between us and Solomon's situation. The Old Testament temple worship was governed by God's grace and the provision of forgiveness. People were gathered for the hearing of God's word. Uh, That's what we're here for. In our public worship, we must encounter our great and glorious God together. Our thoughts must transcend and transform this temporal existence. 
You and I need to be recalibrated to the truth. We need to think God's thoughts after him. We need to come back to an eternal perspective. We need to come back to reality as we gather together. And listen, we only get an hour and a half a week to do it. Have you thought about that? That's competing with 22 and a half other hours on Sunday and six other days in the week. And the whole week, the world is squeezing you into its mold. And teachers at school are pressing you into thinking their thoughts and Satan's thoughts and the world's thoughts and who knows what kind of thoughts. The culture around us desperately wants us to be like it so that the culture isn't threatened. And we're tempted to bring the culture into here. This is the one place that's different. A refuge, a recalibration. My friends, we need to be here. And we need not take it lightly. We need to be here to be reset from the world's pressures and entertainments and distractions and values and temptations. An hour and a half out of a whole week competes with all the rest. Can I offer you this morning some suggestions for preparing your heart to go vertical during corporate worship? Starting in September, we are going to change the format on Sunday mornings. We're going to adjust a few things. We're going to take some things out, put some things in that I think will help us in this area to, to focus our minds, our hearts in, in some different ways, even if it's just we're going to do it different so we think intentionally about what we're doing. Here's some practical suggestions for you. And these are just things I thought of. You might think of other things. Number one, sleep. Sleep before you come. And you're thinking, oh man, I picked a bad morning to fall asleep during this sermon. He's looking right at me. I saw that. I'm just kidding. A pastor, a friend of mine, said it, it seemed like he said it every Sunday morning, and some of you were under this same ministry. He said, Sunday morning starts Saturday night. There's something to that. Dads and moms, here's a suggestion. You can help prepare others in your home. Husband and wife, you can help prepare each other to be here together. Parents, you can Help your kids get here. You know, Josh Kelso sends out the songs, or Sam, if Sam's leading or singing, they'll send out the songs the week ahead of time to, to all the participants who serve us with instruments um, so that they can have the music ahead of time. I'm on that list. I don't play any of the instruments. You can be on that list. Just email Josh and say, hey, I want to be on the song list. And, and you'll get that mass email. And so you can be singing the songs we'll sing here ahead of Sunday mornings. And we do that sometimes as a family on Saturday night to sing some of the songs. And if you've got little kids who aren't reading yet, that's a great way to get them familiar and ready and prepared to sing. If you have roommates or siblings, there are things you could think of to do to help prepare each other to be here and ready to worship. A great thing you can do to prepare is to pray. You can pray throughout the week. For those who will serve, for those who will serve with instrumentation, those who will serve in the sound booth, those who will serve in setup, those who will serve in NGM, the teachers who are preparing God's word to teach all of our kids, for all of the servants that do all the things invisible behind the scenes, pray for them. You can pray for the sermon, for the preparation, for the study, for the heart condition of all those who will bring God's word, for those who are preparing communion messages. There are a group of faithful people who meet in the prayer room at the kind of the back of the building on Sunday mornings. And they get together on Sunday mornings and they pray together so that all of us would be prepared to walk in this room and worship God from the heart. You recognize that what happens here, if it's going to be real, has to be supernatural. You can't worship God unless you're born again. And, and so we pray for people to be raised from the dead, to receive new life through the gospel, to be born again, regenerated. 
And if the Holy Spirit is to work in our hearts to give us a hearing of God's word so as to obey, if he's going to equip us with spiritual gifts to serve one another in the context of the body, we need him. He's not an impersonal force. He's a person. And so we pray that the Holy Spirit would be active and involved on Sunday mornings in the preaching of the word, in the hearing of the word, in our fellowship. You can pray for these things and and they meet at 9.15 in the prayer room on Sunday mornings. You can join them on Sunday mornings and pray together. You can pray for yourself and for others. There's another thing you can do to be ready. Confess sin. Confess sin when you know that it's there, right? Keep short accounts before God. You don't have to wait till the communion time to examine your heart. You can do that on Sunday morning, Saturday night, every day. Come prepared to remember Jesus in communion. You might give thought to the way that you dress. You're thinking, oh great, I picked the perfect Sunday to go without a tie. Listen, there is a casual approach to God that is dressed to the nines, right? A mere external formality is not pleasing to God. And if you come dressed up super snazzy to impress people, you've missed the point. But you and I can be thoughtful. We ought to revere God and the things that we do. Another thing you can do to prepare is to arrive early. Arrive early. The prayer room at 9.15, coffee is served early in the hallway. That is a ploy and a trick to try to get you here sooner. (laughs) You know you're allowed to be seated in here prior to 10 a.m. You can do that. I'm going to give you a very practical, I hope this isn't crude. Um, Use the restroom. Think about that. Plan ahead. Um, If if you're leaving in the middle of this precious hour and a half because you haven't planned ahead. I know things happen. There are always contingencies, but just prepare. Just prepare. Here's another one. Mean the words. Intend what you sing. The words are on the screen. We're thinking about what we're seeing. Have your heart and your brain engaged. If you just find yourself, oh yeah, great melody, Oh, great. Oh, that, I like the way that flowed. I like the instrumentation. And, and you've forgotten the content? Stop yourself. Pray. Reset. Think about what you're singing. When someone's praying publicly, pray along. You might use different words. You might echo the words that are being said. But find a way to engage your brain in what's being prayed as we pray together corporately. And then discipline your mind for listening to God's word. And listen, if you have prayed for the sermon, then you're going to be much more likely to pay attention. You're going to be listening for answers to prayer, right? Discipline your mind to listen well to God's word. And then give thought to distracting or not distracting others. Sometimes we're so eager to see each other that conversations extend into this short time that we have together to worship God corporately. Let's just be thoughtful about that. Listen, here's a caveat to all of that. The, The corporate gathering is about us being together. Us being together to worship God publicly and corporately. And we love to be together. Right, this, this hour and a half or two hours is precious, not just because of the things we've already talked about, but because of each other. We love being together. And, and if you're eager to give thought to the, some of the practical things I've mentioned, um, let's be gentle with each other in that. Uh, to those who maybe weren't in this room this morning, you know, next generation servants, uh, maybe they didn't listen to the tape, they come in next morning and they tap you on the shoulder during the first song and they say, hey brother, it's great to see you. Don't shut them down. (laughs) Find a kind way to do what you should do, to be prepared to be vertical. Think about our one and a half hours a week. I hope it's not a duty that you feel like you have to fulfill. Check off a box. Listen, gathering together to worship God is an unspeakable privilege opportunity for recalibration 
for an eternal perspective, for singing, for fellowship, for prayer, for remembrance, for the hearing of God's word. What we need most together in this experience is an encounter with our great and glorious God. Let's pray. God, thank you for these old words from another context and another setting as an opportunity for us to think about how we approach you together publicly. We worship you. You are our king. You deserve far better than we can give. We just even confess that our tears need to be cried over, our prayers need to be prayed for, our worship is lamentable. And yet, by your grace and your kindness, you have covered all of our imperfect attempts at declaring your worth by the blood of your Son. And for that, we are humbled and eager to burst out in even more gratitude as we worship you, our King.